Okay, so this, uh, this next weekend is going to be anniversary. So uh, hopefully if you're joining us for bowling, um, please RSVP on Team App. I want today to be the last day. So for those of you who are looking at you, looking at you and you guys, if you haven't uh, RSVP'd it, you'll probably expect me to come and ask you at least because I need to try and confirm those numbers so that on tomorrow I've got to contact the bowling alley just to like pay the deposit and um, you know just get it all ready. So please if you're planning on coming or if you're not planning on coming, there's also an RSVP no. So if you know you're not coming, you can RSVP no and then nobody's wondering whether you're coming or not. You know, if you RSVP no. Then, then, I, then I know, then I don't need to ask you because you've already RSVP'd no. So that's next Saturday, it's going to be 4 o'clock. Sunday, hopefully you guys are here. To, to, hopefully the weather's not like this. But uh, next Sunday, we want to take a group photo. I like to just take a group photo every anniversary so I can put it on the website. Just so it's an up-to-date group photo of our church. So if you want to be in that photo, hopefully all of, everybody does, you can take a photo next Sunday. Now Friday night at 7 o'clock, hopefully you guys haven't forgotten, we're having a night of prayer and fasting. I want you guys to RSVP because if we have enough people, or a lot of people, then I won't have it at my place. We'll try and get this place and have the prayer meeting here. If there's not that many people, I just have it at my place. It just saves money, right? No, no point spending another 165 bucks just to rent out <coughs> this place when the group's small enough to meet at my place. So that's why there's an RSVP for Friday night. So if you're coming on Friday night for prayer and fasting, uh, please RSVP, let me know. But I wanted to encourage you guys to come because we have the prayer and fasting coming up. That's why I'm preaching on prayer and fasting today. Uh, give you some thoughts on prayer <coughs> from the scriptures. <coughs> and encourage you to come along if you've never, I mean, you know, it's up to you whether you fast or not. It's not like I'm going to be, we're going to be checking at the door, you know, are you eating? You know, if you're not, it's like, you know, it's a prayer and fasting meeting, you know, get out of here. Obviously, fasting is between you and the Lord, but I think getting together to pray is definitely biblical. We'll see some examples of that in the Bible. Um, some churches don't get together to pray, you know, they just leave prayer up to the individuals in the church. But I think it is good that we get together every now and then and pray as a church. If at the very least, if you don't pray much in your own personal life, when you come to church, um, you pray and you come together for a prayer meeting. Uh, that's, that's one reason why I, we have prayer on Sundays, right? Because most churches, they have like a separate <coughs> prayer meeting. And we do that sometimes, right? And that's why every time we do that, we make it a prayer and fasting so that it's more like a emphasized prayer meeting. But that's why, you know, when I started this church, I wanted to have prayer on Sunday. So you're wondering why, like, why do we get together for two hours? It's because rather than try and ask you to come back three times a week, just come on Sunday and spend some time with your church family, you know, and come and sing, read the Bible, pray together, listen to preaching, eat together. You know, I thought that was more of an efficient way to spend our time rather than getting you to come back and, three times a week, you know, to do different things. And then you waste all that travel time, right? All that travel time, we could be praying, we could be singing. So if you're wondering why our church meeting runs like that, is because I thought it would be more efficient, you know, because I didn't, I didn't start this church to be up here to, to give you a show, do you know what I mean? Be up here, have the lights and the music, you come here, you're entertained. No, I, I started this church so you come together and participate. You know, you come, you sing, you come, you read. You come, you, 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 do, you do listen to some preaching, but then now it's a smaller portion of the meeting rather than 90% of the meeting. And you come, you eat together. You come, you spend time together. You come, you sing together. Did I already say that one? But you know, you, you get what I'm saying? So that, that's the mentality behind why this church is run the way it is and why it's different to other churches because other churches are there to give you a show. You come in, you're comfortable. They're up there to entertain you and you're the guest. You know, when you come here, you're not, you're a church member. You're a participant. <laughs> you're not, you're not, yeah, we have guests, but you're coming here every week. You're no longer a guest, right? You're a church member. You could get involved. You've got to make this church happen because that's, that's what's, why this church will do great things. It's not just because I'm going to do, I do a lot of things because we all do things. You guys help. That's why this church does. If it was me just on my own, man, I'd probably would have burnt out already. Uh, what was I talking about? So uh, prayer on Friday night. <laughs> um, hopefully you'll come along. Uh, please RSVP. 
and give a few thoughts on prayer and fasting uh, in this sermon. And the reason why we're doing the prayer meeting on Friday, then bowling on Saturday, and then Sunday anniversary, is because before we started this church, um, you know, Michael and I got together to pray and fast for the success of this church. And I believe that played a big part in why this church is successful, right? Because God's blessing this church, God's helping to get the word out. Um, it's because we have prayed many times, me and Michael, have got together, prayed and fasted for this church, um, that it would be successful. <coughs> we don't know what the future holds, you know? <coughs> um, obviously, the people that we started the church with, they're not all here. And I, even, I remember even saying to Michael, like, you know, maybe one day you're not going to be here and, you know, he's going to be moving back to the Czech Republic. It's going to be a sad day. But, you know, uh, our life takes, off, takes us in, in different ways. And I think, um, you know, uh, God will work all things for good. So that's why I think it's great. I want to continue that tradition um, on our church anniversary because when we started the church, you know, it started with asking God to bless it. And I think we want to continue that each year. And that's why we have that Friday night prayer meeting. I always like to have that um, before the church anniversary. And for those of you who have been here um, for, for the church, we, we usually do that. I don't think I've missed a year. Uh, so uh, hopefully this year you have the heart, right, to seek God's blessing on our church and you'll join us <coughs> either at the house or, or here. Now what is prayer? A lot of people think prayer is just talking to God. Um, but there's different types of talking to God, right? There's thanksgiving, there's praise to God, right? There's intercession, which is a type of prayer when you're asking for something, for somebody else. But prayer, prayer the, the word pray means to ask or to request. If you just type and search pray in the Bible, the first phrase you'll see, and you'll see this many times in the Bible, is when somebody says, I pray thee, right? Because they're asking. It's like, I ask you to do something. I pray thee that you would do this for me. So... A prayer is really when we ask God for something, right? So we might give thanks, we might praise God, but you haven't necessarily prayed in the sense that you've asked him to do something for you. So that's what the word prayer means. And, you know, we can talk about how to pray. A uh, famous passage, if we look at the Lord's Prayer, where the disciples asked Jesus, you know, teach us to pray in uh, Luke. <coughs> but we'll look at um, the parallel passage in Matthew first where Jesus says here, and this is really the, the model prayer, and it's an example prayer. You know, a lot of people, they take the Lord's Prayer and they think this is something that we should just repeat, you know. That, that's, not, that's not the point that Jesus is making here when he says this is how you pray. He's giving us an example and giving us certain things that, that can be in a prayer, right? But this is not the only way you can pray or the only thing you can say to pray because obviously we have many instances throughout the Bible of people praying and they're not just saying this a million billion times over and over again um, because this is the only way to pray. Um, Jesus is just giving us an example. <clears throat> so he says here, After this manner therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So that we can see here, like I said, this is not exactly how your prayer has to be <coughs> sort of structured, but we see some things here that you might want to include in your prayer. One is that we recognize who we're talking to we, and we praise God for who he is. Now, one thing people get from the Lord's Prayer, and they say here, well, Jesus said, uh, well, we pray to the Father, right? And we say, and then people say, well, that's the only person we should pray to. Should we pray to Jesus or we pray to the Father? Honestly, the way I think about the Trinity and the way I think God's nature is, I don't think it makes a difference, right? Because they're three, they're one, you're praying to the same God either way. Um, but people will say here, well, Jesus is giving us the model and he addressed his prayer to the Father. Um, and they say, so we should always address our prayers to the Father in the name of Jesus Christ. And that's how most people pray. The problem with that is, is that there are examples in the Bible where people are praying to Jesus. You know, Jesus even says in John 14, we'll see that later, that he answers prayer. So if he answers prayer, but you're not praying to him, why is he answering your prayer? It's one thing. But we actually have examples. Uh, and I'll just go to that very quickly. <coughs> um, let's go to Acts. Um, I just wanted to show you the clearest examples, but if you search online, if you just Google it, you'll see other people, you'll get lists of examples that you can find in the Bible. Um, but I'll show you a couple real quick. <coughs> so here's one where in Acts 8, <coughs> Stephen is actually being stoned 
right? And he's dying, and in his dying breath, it says, and they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, and he says, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Right? So he's praying to God, because he asked later on, he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, right? So he's praying to Jesus, lay not this sin to their charge. So he is actually praying for something. He's asking Jesus not to lay this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now, if the model prayer means we never address a prayer to Jesus, we always address prayers to the Father, I mean, why, why do we see examples of this where people are praying to Jesus? Um, they're not just praying to the Father. Why? Because it's, it's, it's the one God, right? It's all the same. Um, <coughs> and obviously, I'm, I'm not talking, I'm not preaching on the Trinity. I'm obviously simplifying it a bit, but, you know, we, we believe in one God, which is in three persons. Okay, so let's show you another example. I just want to show you a couple others. 12, 7. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 7. It says here... Oh, sorry, 2 Corinthians 12, 7. Maybe uh, those of you who are familiar with your Bible, you know what passage I'm going to, but this is where Paul um, actually asks Jesus to remove the thorn in the flesh. So remember, Paul had a thorn in the flesh, and we don't know whether this is a person... Maybe it was a sickness. Maybe it was some uh, thing that he was, had trouble with. <coughs> well, look at what he says here. He says, unless I should be... <coughs> ah, let me just get a drink. It's when I talk, I, I start coughing. Because you see, when I sing, I'm not, I'm not coughing. And when I'm sitting there, I'm not coughing. When I talk, I start coughing. 2 Corinthians 12... Verse 7, unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelation, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Look at this. <coughs> For this thing, I besought the Lord thrice. So you ask, well, who is the Lord that he's beseeching? Because right? at this point, somebody could say, well, is he beseeching the Father? He's also the Lord. Or is he beseeching Jesus? I think he's beseeching Jesus. Um, but it says here that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. So whose strength is made perfect in weakness? The Lord, the one he's asking, right? And then he says, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon him. So what is the strength? The strength is Christ's strength. That's who he's praying to. <coughs> so he's asking Jesus three times if he can remove the thorn in the flesh. And Jesus says to him, Hey, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And this is why, like in some Bibles, people actually put this as red, um, in red letter, because of the red letter, they, they, they believe, hey, this is when Jesus is actually speaking. But just remember, the red letter is just, it's just a man, it's just man's opinion on the text, right? So the, the red letter is not um, inspired in any way. It's, it's just a help in the text, just like the chapters and verse breakdowns are helps in the text. They're not necessarily inspired. It says, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So that's the power of the one that he's praying to. <clears throat> last one I'll show you is one we looked at last week. But you remember, we, we call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. Right? So we call upon the name of Jesus to be saved. And uh, remember here, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. So we don't only call, call upon the name of the Lord to be saved, but we also call on the name of the Lord for help and other things as, as well. <clears throat> and, you know, we couldn't pray to Jesus. You know, like I said, why is Jesus <laughs> answering prayers? Why is he talking to people? We can even look at, you know, in Ananias' situation where Paul went to Ananias and Jesus is talking to him and he's, he's praying to Jesus, saying, Lord, you know, all the people that call on your name, this person is persecuting people. So like I said, I think the Lord's Prayer is a model prayer and, and you know, maybe, maybe Jesus did it that way in the sense because if he was teaching people how to pray, he's not teaching people to pray to themselves, so he's not going to address himself in a prayer when he's teaching others to pray. So he prays to the Father and then we can pray to Jesus as well as the Father. <coughs> That's my thoughts on the Lord's Prayer. Let's go back to the Lord's Prayer though. Um, look at some other... I just thought I'd touch on that one. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done uh, in earth as it is in heaven. So one thing we can pray for is that God's will is done in earth. You know, and, and we're part of that will. Right? When we pray that God's will is done, we're not just also praying that other people will accomplish God's will. We also want to fulfill that as well. So we ask to, to help us fulfill God's will in earth as it is in heaven. 
give us this day our daily bread. So this is where you can pray for sustenance, right? That God will provide your daily needs, not only uh, physical, but spiritual as well. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts. So this is why when we pray, we often should ask God to forgive us of our sins, right? We come to God and we confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. As we forgive our debtors, right? So we also should ask to help, ask to help, right? To forgive others. You know, here it's the assumption is that we're already forgiving our debtors and this is why we can come to God to ask for forgiveness, right? Because we should already be forgiving those who are indebted to us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So here's a request to help us to live right, to stay away from what is wrong, stay away from temptation, stay away from sin. <coughs> and then lastly, a praise, right? For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <coughs> so there are different things, different factors we see in there that we can, we can think, hey, well, well, when I pray to God, what can I pray for? Well, here are some uh, things that we can pray for just in the model prayer, in the Lord's Prayer. Now, <coughs> there are some unimportant factors, right, in how to pray. And some people get stuck on these things sometimes. They might ask, well, what, how do you phrase your prayer? Like some people are, are scared to pray in public or scared to pray in a prayer meeting in a group of people and they're a bit self-conscious because they're like, well, I don't know how to, what to say. They listen to other people praying and they're like, well, this person's so eloquent. They think, well, but, but it's, it's not about how eloquent you are. It's just a matter of what you say. You know, you're just meant to be praying from the heart. Those of us who uh, are just more comfortable with public speaking and we have more things on our heart, that's why it just sounds like we have a lot of things to pray for because we want, well, there's a lot of things on our mind. There's a lot of things our heart. There's a lot of things that we want God to bless uh, and, 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 and um, help us with. So when you're saying, well, how do I pray in terms of what do I say? You know, you, sh you should just be praying like you would be asking someone, like you'd be talking to somebody and asking for them. That's, that's how you pray to God. God is not interested in just fancy words and fancy speeches. He, he's interested in the heart, in the sincerity, right? So how you pray uh, people ask you, what position to pray in? You know, should you be kneeling? Should you be standing? We see all these different examples in the Bible. And that's not really what this sermon is about, but we see all these different examples in the Bible. You know, people lifting their hands up praying, people that are prostrate, people on their knees. Um, you know, we don't know all the different ways because it's not important the position in which you pray, right? It's the heart in which you pray. Uh, people ask, well, should your eyes be open or should your eyes be closed? Well, you pray how, in a way that you don't fall asleep. If you're, if you're falling asleep because you're praying with your eyes closed, then open your eyes. You know, if you're falling asleep because you're sitting in your seat praying, maybe get up, you know, wake yourself up so that you're alert. So you're praying from the heart. That's, that's what it's about. It's about being attentive and actually praying in the spirit, being attentive when you pray. Um, doesn't matter whether your eyes are closed, what hands your position is, whether you're standing and kneeling all these different things, you know, these are just personal preferences. Even the time of day to pray. Some people wake up early in the morning to pray. Some people pray before they go to sleep. There's all different preferences and there's no right or wrong. These are the unimportant factors, right? This is where your heart should be in the right place. Now there are some other, there are some important factors, right? One is here, we go to uh, John. <coughs> now you'll notice when people pray, you know, we, we have this tradition that we end and say, in Jesus' name, amen. We pray these things in Jesus' name. This is actually a, a biblical pattern in the sense. This is a biblical behavior or a biblical activity because Jesus says here, whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you, if you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. So this is an interesting thing because you know how uh, you know, uh, Muslims always go to John 14 talking about the comforter. There's so much in John 14 that just absolutely demolishes Islam, right? And this is one of them where you've got Jesus answering prayer. Now, if Jesus is just a prophet, how is he answering prayer, right? He's answering prayer because he's God, right? He's able to hear prayer. He's able to answer prayer. He even says here, well, if you ask the Father in my name, he's going to do it, right? He's, gonna, he's going to fulfill he's going to uh, answer that prayer now if he was just a man if he's just a prophet obviously he can't answer prayer so this is why if you're wondering why when people pray they say in jesus name amen this is why this is where it comes from because jesus said if we ask anything in his name he will do it and obviously there are 
caveats on that, right? Because you know we have to ask things according to His will, and we ask things that that would glorify Him. We're not just asking things to consume it upon our lust. God just doesn't give us everything that we want. <clears throat> but if there's something that is according to His will, we can ask Him, and believing that He will do it. <coughs> So we pray in Jesus' name. What about the other important factors? How often to pray? How long to pray? Now, I'm not going to say there's, there's a set amount, but the reason why I say these are important factors is because how long you pray and how often you pray really begs the question of how, how much do you want it? How much do you actually care about the thing you're praying about? How much do you actually want God to actually intervene and step in and actually do something that's going to determine how long <coughs> and how often you pray. Because why do we pray? Right? Like why, why pray? We're not, we're not praying. And we'll just we'll go on here. <laughs> Matthew 6, verse 7. Because when we pray, right, we're not just praying to let God know we have a prayer request, Right? Because look, look at what it says here, right? It says here in Matthew 6, verse 7. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. Now, this is not saying it's wrong to necessarily pray for the same thing. Again, a vain repetition is when you're just saying meaningless words. And <clears throat> that's not to say people can't pray the same thing. Pray for the same thing again and again and again. We'll see that in the Bible. We do request things from God and pray for it again and again and again. But what he's condemning here is when they use vain repetitions, where they're just repeating words just for the sake of repeating words, and they don't actually care what the prayer says. They don't, you know what I mean? That, that's what vain repetition is. And he's saying here, for they think they shall be heard for their much speaking. Just because you say a lot of words, that doesn't mean God's going to pay any more attention to you, right? Because it needs to come from the heart. You need to be actually care what you're praying about and seeking him to answer that prayer. But this is what I wanted to point out here. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. So then you've got to ask the question, if God already knows what I'm going to pray for, why am I, why am I even praying? Well, it's because you're not praying to let God know that you have a prayer request. You're praying to let God know that you want him to answer that prayer request. Right? That you're trying to get a hold of him. You're trying to show him your sincerity. Hey, God, I care enough to pray about this thing and fast about this thing so that you will actually come and do something right? and actually change something. <clears throat> and I'll show you that here in Luke. I'll just uh, look at this. This is a really interesting parable because it tells us at the beginning of Luke 18.1 why this parable is here. It says here, And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. So he's about to tell us this parable. Why is he telling us this parable? Because Jesus is trying to encourage people to keep on praying and not to cease praying because when you continue to pray for something, it does actually make a difference. Look here, saying, There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. <coughs> and I just think it's interesting that God leaves. It's like he's able to change things. But then he, he sort of puts the ball in our court to see, like, well, do you, you know, I could change this, but do you want it enough? Because, you know, maybe it, I don't know how to think of it from his point of view, right? Sometimes it's hard to think of how a time-based life and our, how our life changes based on time, but God is outside of time and how he sees things. So I'm not saying I understand how God thinks, but we can learn here how prayer works why we have to pray and why we should ought to continue to pray because when the amount of prayer and the length of prayer and the amount of times we pray makes a difference according to the bible <clears throat> saying there was a there was in in a city a judge which feared not god neither regarded man and there was a widow in that city and she came unto him saying avenge me of mine adversary and he would not for a while but afterward he said within himself though i fear not god nor regard man Yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. So what's the situation here? Is that a widow, there was a widow, right? Yeah, a widow comes to this judge and says, hey, I, know, I want justice. And this is an unjust judge. But he, he ends up doing his job and getting off his lazy rear end because this widow keeps coming back to him, right? And keeps asking for this request. 
And God is not saying he's a lazy judge, but he's saying here, and the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge saith, and shall not God. So he's saying, hey, listen to what's happening with this unjust judge, where an ungodly person, an unjust judge, if somebody keeps going to them, eventually they're going to cave in and do it. And then he says here, and shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. So he's saying, hey, God is not an unjust judge. So if an unjust judge is, is not able to bear with somebody coming to them continually, how much more will God answer our prayers if we come to him continually in earnest prayer, in fervent prayer, asking for him to change something? <clears throat> now there's another example which I won't go to for sake of time but in Luke 5 we have the friend and the loaves where somebody's in bed the friend comes to them and you know he, he won't doesn't want to get up to get the loaves but if somebody if somebody keeps coming to him he'll eventually get up to get the loaves and then that is compared to to God as well in the sense that God will answer our prayers <clears throat> so that's why we pray we pray not to let God know what our requests are because he already knows what they are, but we pray because we're letting God know that we're serious about these requests. And this is also the reason why we fast, right? So we pray and fast. So, so it's like, why, why do we fast? Why would you deny yourself food in order to pray? Well, we do that because we're trying to get God's attention, right? We're trying to get God's hand to move. He's left that in our court. It's not that God's being unjust. It's not that God's being slack. It's that he's, he's put the ball in your court. Right? He's, he's given you this ability to tap into something supernatural and it's whether or not we're going to take advantage of that. Right? Whether or not we want that enough to seek his help on something that we care about. <clears throat> Let's go to Ezra 8. And I like always sharing this verse when we have a prayer and fasting meeting. It says here, Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava that we might afflict ourselves before our God to seek of him a right way for us and for our little ones and for all our substance. For I was ashamed to require of the king a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way, because we had spoken unto the king, saying, The hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek him, but his power and his wrath is against all them that forsake him. So we fasted and besought our God for this. See, they fasted and they prayed. Look at this. And he was entreated of us. So this is why we pray, this is why we fast, to ask God for help. Now what is fasting? Fasting is just to go for a period of time without food. But it's not just, fasting is not just going without food, right? <clears throat> fasting is when you go without food for the purpose of prayer. Right? Because it's not just a vain tradition. It's not just like the Greek Orthodox or the Catholics where they just have a period of time where they just fast because that's just what they do. That's just their tradition. That's not what fasting is for. Fasting is not just this tradition that you just do to make yourself feel holier. We don't fast to feel holy. We're, we're fasting because we want to afflict ourselves to pray to God to ask Him for His blessing on the work or to ask for other things. There are other things that people pray and fast well, it's not just to feel a tradition it's not just to make ourselves feel more righteous um, let's go to matthew 6 here <coughs> look at what it says here it says moreover when ye fast be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance for they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast verily i say unto you they have their reward see so we don't fast just to let the world know that we're fasting and you know you walk around and you're all disheveled and you know you're looking really bad that's not the reason why we fast it's not just how we look to other people but thou when thou fastest anoint thine head and wash thy face that thou appear not unto men to fast but unto thy father which is in secret and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly so you see the purpose of fasting is to get the father's attention it's not to get man's attention right it's not just to fulfill a tradition now fasting is a new testament thing <coughs> there's a lot of fasting in the old testament a lot of fasting in the gospels you know fasting is mentioned in the gospels um there's not so much fasting mentioned in the new testament epistles but there, but it is there so we'll just take a look at it look at it quickly see and we fast when there's something more serious we want to pray for if you're really serious about a prayer request that is why you would fast 
you know, to show God that you are really serious about what you're asking him to do. And we see here when people were ordained and they were sent out, there was prayer and fasting. That's why when we sent Kevin out and I ordained Kevin, sent him over to the Sunshine Coast, that's why that Sunday we didn't eat because it was a time of prayer and fasting and we had people pray for Kevin as we came here because it was a more serious event. It was something that we really wanted God to bless and he has blessed greatly. I mean, Kevin's doing a great work up there. I'm always so pleased to hear of all the stuff that's happening up there, how he handles things. Um, it's good. Okay, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work where I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed, they laid and laid their hands on them. They sent them away. So that's the passage I, these are the passages I go to of why we did it that way. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. So you have the ordination where they pray and, and they, you know, they lay their hands on them, they send them away to do a work. And this is where there's the church where they come and they ordain people in the church and then they move on, right? But again, it's done with prayer and fasting. Now, the last one I'll show you in the New Testament is in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 5, where, you know, I talked about, like, fasting is not just to feel holier. It's not just to fulfill a tradition. We see here in 1 Corinthians 7, 5 that talks about the responsibility that a husband and a wife have to each other in terms of fulfilling physical intimacy but it says here defraud ye not one the other so he's saying don't withhold you know uh, uh, the bedroom and, and um, sleeping together from your husband or your wife except it be with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency so you see one the reason why you fast and pray you, you, you would you know not you know take that pleasure from your husband or your wife is to come together to fast to come and fast and pray so when we fast and we're denying ourselves from pleasures that's also a reason not to you know sleep with your spouse you know to, you're denying yourself of pleasures but only for a time because you don't want Satan to tempt you right you don't go weeks and weeks on end you know denying your spouse because you're praying and fasting you still have that um, obligation all right so that's uh, why we fast now, <coughs> I want to go through really quickly. I'll breeze through these. But what I wanted to show you just throughout the Bible, I thought you might find interesting, is things that um, believers in the Bible, examples of things that people prayed for in the Bible. So it can give you some ideas of what to pray for for your fellow believers and brothers and sisters in Christ. So I thought I'd just go through this really quickly. But in Ephesians 1, we see here some examples of Paul praying, and what were the thought, sort of things that he prayed for? He says here in Ephesians 1, 15, the Bible reads, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Now there's a passage I don't have in this, in this uh, sermon, but it says, the Bible says pray without ceasing. Now that doesn't mean that you're just praying continually, right? Because there are other things that we need to do besides pray. It's sort of like when the Bible says they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. It's not that they were just continually, that's all they did, because sometimes they would be working and whatnot, or doing other things. It just means that they didn't quit doing it. Right? When it says to pray without ceasing, that you don't quit at praying. And that's why even uh, when we looked at that parable in Luke 18, that we ought to pray, you know, it says we, he spake this parable then to them that men should pray and not faint, right? that they won't stop praying, because when you stop praying, that's when prayer is ineffective, right? But if you keep on praying, then it's effective. <clears throat> it says here, Cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of, in, of his inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the, uh, to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. So I know when, if you're not familiar with these passages, you might read passages like this and just say, you know, what is Paul talking about? I have no idea. But you know, that's why you have people like me to help explain it to you, right? But what he's praying for here, and I, you probably caught it, is he's praying 
for people to have understanding, right? That they would grow in wisdom. So he's praying for his fellow believers to say, I hope that God will open your eyes, that your eyes of your understanding would be enlightened and you would realize the glory of God, the hope of his calling, the the riches of his glory in the state, his exceeding greatness of his power. Paul prayed that his fellow believers would see God in the same light that he saw God, right? Because he saw the revelation. He knew how great God was. He knew the riches and the hope of his calling. And he was praying that believers would see the same thing, right? That's one thing you can pray for. You know, if you love God, you can say, hey, I'm going to pray for these people. Pray that other people will see God in the same light that I see God. Um, What's another one, right? Let's go to Colossians. Uh, Colossians 4, this is like the parallel passage. (coughs) Uh, Sorry, Colossians 1. Because why does he want people to see God in the same light that he does? For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Why? That ye might walk worthy of of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. You see, Paul understood that if if people would see Jesus, if they would see him for his greatness, if they would see what he does in their life, right? How much God gives you, how much God does for you, how much God blesses you. I mean, we take all that for granted, right? Because we take for granted that we can see, right? Because when we think about God blessing us, we think, well, God didn't didn't give me a good job. He didn't give me a good house. He didn't give me like, you know, all these different, these materialistic worldly things that people are, you know, greedy for. And materi- no, no, God gave you life. God gave you your sight. God gave you the ability to walk and to talk and to experience love. All these different things that you take for granted, that's what Jesus gave you, right? That's why it's reasonable for you to serve him because he gives you the very breath that you breathe. And Paul is saying here, if you see Jesus... The way I see Jesus, maybe you'll serve Jesus the way I serve Jesus. That's what he's saying, right? That you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, that you would actually be fruitful, you actually get to work and, and, and do something for God, increasing in the knowledge of God and continue to learn. This is what Epaphras, uh, there's no book of Epaphras, uh, 4.12, that's what he's praying for. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you always laboring fervently for you in prayers that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. So we see a pattern here. If you want to know what do you pray for for each other, well, pray that people would walk worthy, right? They'd be pleasing, they would increase in knowledge. That's what we ought to be praying for each other, right? And maybe when you're praying for each other, then you'll think about each other, right? Think about, hey, you know, man, are you, are you, when's the last time you went soul winning? You know, you're, you're, you're slacking off in church. Because you're praying for these people, you have them on your heart. Uh, let's go to another passage. Um, what else can we pray for? And these are no, no particular order. Um, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. <clears throat> That's Paul saying that we pray for each other, right? And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. So when Paul asked for a prayer request, isn't it interesting, this is what he prayed for. He asked that people would pray for him, that he would have the boldness to speak the gospel when he had the opportunity. That's something that we should pray for each other, right? Like that when we have the opportunity that we speak boldly. And, and I'm not Superman up here. I know what it's like. You know, you don't want to seem awkward. Is it the right time to bring up? We all need boldness, right? When there's an opportunity, we need boldness to bring it up with colleagues, bring it up with friends and bring it up with people that we come across with. The boldness to go out soul winning. Well, that's, that's the reason why people don't go soul winning, right? Because they lack boldness. They're scared to go and talk to somebody and open their Bible and preach to them the gospel. So that's something that we should pray for, for each other. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 1, 2 is another example where Paul is praying for a church here. <coughs> we give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. So he, the Thessalonian church was a great example to the believers, right? So here he's not praying for them necessarily to, 
to work because they're not doing as much work. He's like remembering the work that they do. He's thankful for that. Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God, for our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. And you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy in the Holy Ghost. So he's praying here that they would continue, right? That they would endure, that they would go through those afflictions because he knows that, that as they started to live for God, they, they came across persecution. They came across affliction. And that's why he's praying for them here. He says, you might have missed it here. He says here, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope. Now, patience in the Bible is not just you're willing to wait for something. Patience is when you go through hard times, right? These is, this is the patience of the saints. <clears throat> patience in persecution. Let's, uh, let's look at some others uh, quickly. I'm not going through these as quick as I said I would. Uh, two, one. Here's another thing that we should pray for. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplication, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men. For kings and for all that are in authority, why? That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. So that's why we pray for all those that are in authority. We don't just pray just blindly, just asking God to bless their work and whoever's in authority, it doesn't matter if it's the left or the right, whoever the prime minister is, we just want God to bless them. No, because sometimes we need to pray for them to come out of office so that we can live a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. So we're not just praying for people blindly and just, you know, as a Christian, we're just praying for everyone, that God will bless everyone. God will just, no. Because it's not saying here that you just pray for everyone willy-nilly, not thinking about who they are and what they're trying to accomplish. We pray for all that are in authority. Why? That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. We're praying that the government would leave us alone, you know, and let us practice our religion let us practice christianity in peace and live in godliness without them persecuting us um, what's another example of prayer, uh, things we can pray, pray for <coughs> this is one in philemon <coughs> see if i have to put a one there good Paul writing to Philemon here, I thank my God making mention of thee always in my prayers. Are you getting, you're seeing a pattern here that Paul was a praying man. Like this is, this is something that we all need to strive for. It's something that we all struggle with, right? Because prayer requires a lot of faith. But we see here, Paul had a lot of faith. I mean, how many times could he write to these churches saying, I'm praying for you guys. You know, I'm always making mention of you in my prayers. Hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. So there's another thing to pray for, to pray that our work would be effective, right? That it would be effectual. <clears throat> What's another one? Revelation 6. <coughs> <coughs> we actually just read this. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? So this is another thing to pray for, right? Like God, God says, give place unto wrath, because we don't take vengeance ourselves. But it's not wrong to pray for God to take vengeance, that God will do what's right. God will make things right for evil people in this world and people that are doing wrong people that are murdering, people that are, you know, committing all sorts of, you know, adultery and homosexuality and bestiality, that God would do something about that. That's, it's not wrong to pray for God to take vengeance on people that are destroying our country. Um, what are other things we can pray for? I want to go, look at this, in Philippians, he says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. So sometimes you can pray when you're worried about something. You know, there's the song, you know, why worry when you can pray? Trust Jesus, he'll be your stay. I don't know all the words. You know, don't be a doubting Thomas. Rest, trust, rest truly on his promise. Why worry, 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 worry when you can pray? So that's what, that's, this song comes from this passage, right? That we don't worry when we can pray. So if you're worried about something, you can commit it to God in prayer. And uh, a guy in, uh, in Mexico would always say, say to me when, when I was worried, right? Because, I mean, I'm not perfect. 
And we were coming back from Mexico and everything was just going to down the toilet, right? Trying to get back. My dad knows. My dad can tell you this. So I had to call my dad and ask for money and get, me, get myself back to Mexico. Oh, it's the worst experience ever. I'll tell you what happened, right? Just really quickly. Because I didn't know that I needed a, a visa for Elizabeth to travel through a country. Right? I just, I just didn't know that's how it worked. I just thought, like, you know, she's coming to Australia. What does she need a visa to go to America for? Right? She's not going to America. But it turns out that if you want to fly through a country, you need a visa to get through that country. So I had, like, sold everything. I moved out. I, I booked my flights to come back to Australia. And then when I got to the airport, right, like, all we had was a couple of suitcases, Simon in the carrier. And the guy says to me, like, I can't let you on this, on this airplane. I'm just like... I'm like, you got to let me on this aeroplane, right? Like, as I mean, I just, I've got to get back to Australia. Oh, it's the worst thing. But eventually, like, we worked out. But thank God we had people that loved us in Mexico because, you know, he, like, when we, because we moved out already. We'd moved out of the place. We'd sold everything, right? We didn't have a bed. We just had a couple of suitcases. And then when we, when, when we realized, I, 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 I called my dad to get some help. I called uh, the guys back at the church, say, hey, can you put us up? So they put us up in their house for a month while we figured out how to get back to Australia. So we ended up having to fly through Canada. Um, so basically we flew down to Mexico City, flew up to Canada and then through Hong Kong back to Perth because we couldn't just go to the United States and then fly from Los Angeles to Sydney. So anyways, obviously I was really stressed, right? And then um, uh, the guy, his name's Jesus, funnily enough, <laughs> says to me, well, you know, you don't have to worry because if you could do something about it, then you don't have to worry, you just do it. And if you can't do anything about it, then why are you worried? Right? So there's never a good reason to worry, right? But there's always a good reason to pray. So worry, right? If we worry, it's a good reason to pray, right? That God will help us. And he eventually got us here. Thank God. So um, what else? Let's look at these other ones quickly. James 5, 16, and I'm almost done. The Bible says here, confess your faults one to another, pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The point I want to make here is, it's all of our job to pray. Right? You see how it says, confess your faults one to another, pray for one another? It's not just tell your prayer request to the bishop and then he'll pray for everyone. Which is fine, I'm not, I'm not downing anybody if that's what you do. But that's why when somebody tells me a prayer request, I say, hey, you want me to add it onto the prayer list? Because I want everybody to pray for you. I want us all to pray for one another because it's not just my job just to pray for everyone, right? We all pray. It's everyone's job. It's the church's job to pray for one another and to help one another. But look at this. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So you want to make sure, <laughs> we'll go to three. Let's be three, six. That if you want your prayers to be heard from God, you want your prayers to be effectual, you need to be righteous. You need to make sure you get sin out of your life, that you confess your sins to God so that you can have a clean heart, a pure conscience, so when you pray to God that your, that your prayers are not hindered. Because your prayers can be hindered. We have the example here in 1 Peter 3, where we have the, the, the husband and the wife. I'll just skip down to verse 7. Where if there is a bad relationship between a husband and a wife, prayers are hindered. Right? God's not necessarily going to pay attention to your prayers. Because remember how we looked at the Lord's Prayer and it says, forgive us our debts as we forgive those who are, who are indebted to us? Because the assumption is when you come to God, you need to be right already with your fellow man. But if you've got bad relationships with your husband or your wife or your fellow believer, right, then your prayers are going to be hindered. So see, likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, give honor, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. See, husbands have to dwell with their wife according to knowledge, right? They have to understand their wife and know so they can live in peace because they ought to lead that relationship. If there is a bad relationship between a husband and a wife, ultimately it's the husband's responsibility, right? I'm not saying the wife is not at fault. But what I'm saying is the husband, as the leader, it is his responsibility to seek reconciliation and try and make things right and take the lead as the leader, right? So we don't want our prayers to be hindered. So we need to make sure that we are living as righteous as we can <coughs> so that our life does not hinder our prayers. So these are some examples of things we can pray for. And that's why we have this prayer, prayer list, right? So if your prayer requests are not on this prayer list, hey, 
tell me about them so I can add them to this prayer list so that the church can be praying for them. And keep them up to date. You know, I know like I sometimes have to keep mine up to date too. So I'm not saying that I'm perfect. But we need to keep them up to date. But you need to use them as well. I post the prayer list into the Facebook page so that you guys have the link. It's a Google Sheets link. So once you have the link, it's in your recents in Google Sheets, right? So you can always access it. You can access it on your phone. So you can always scroll through it. If you want to pray for your, for your church family, the list is always there. That's why I like it on a Google Sheet because you can always access it. But it's only as good if you use it. Right? You, need to, you need to pray for one another and that's why we have that list. Uh, and I know like, sometimes I'll ask people to come to pray and I'm not, I'm not dissing any of you guys, but I think it's a little shameful to come up and pray for your church and you're praying and you're like, I don't even know who this person is, but God answered their prayer. I don't, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, it shows that you haven't looked at the prayer list. You're not praying for, for, for your church family because you have no idea. Like, and, you know, it's like, and if you don't know somebody in church, go and meet them. Go and introduce yourself. That's why we have dinner afterwards. That's the whole reason why it's, you don't just come here and listen to preaching and then leave because you come here, listen to preaching, you spend some time together so that you can meet the people that you don't know yet. And then you can put some faces to the names on the prayer list and pray for people. So I, I do think it's a little bit shameful, right? If you're, if you're in a prayer, if, if you're in a church for a decent amount of time and, and we're not a big church, right? This is not a, does we, do we look like a mega church to you? Like, this is not a mega church. Like, we're, if we're in a mega church where there's thousands of people, all right, maybe it's a little bit easier to say, I don't know every single person. But in a church of 30 adults, 40 with kids, you ought to know everybody, right? Everybody's name. And if you don't, you're not loving them enough, right? You need to love them enough to get to, get to know them at least and know people by name. <clears throat> now, prayer is something that we all struggle with, obviously, right? Because it takes a lot of faith. And I want to share this story with you from Acts because I just think it's a really funny story that it shows that we're not the only ones that struggle with prayer. And why does prayer take so much faith? Because literally it, you, you have nothing to do with it in the sense that you are literally asking God to do it, right? And that's why prayer takes a lot of faith because everything else in the Christian life is something that you physically can, can affect, in a sense, like soul winning, like you go out and do it, you know, and then, you know, when it comes to like other things in the church, you know, reading your Bible, you know, you do that. Whereas like when it comes to prayer, yes, you are praying, but prayer is you asking God to do something, not you trying to do something yourself. But I, find, I find this story funny because we see here the early church praying. It says here, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. <clears throat> so that's where we see that the church doesn't cease to pray, right? That there's always people in the church praying. It doesn't necessarily mean that that's all the church does. <coughs> so the church comes together to pray for Peter, right? Why? Because Peter is in prison. I don't know if you're familiar with this story in Acts. And when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and the keepers before the door kept the prison. So Peter's in prison. The church is praying for him. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up. So, he, so the angel wakes Peter up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands, and the angel said unto him, Gird thyself and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. So he takes off his, his outer garment, I'm guessing, follows the angel. And he went out and followed him and wist not that it was true which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. So this is all happening to Peter in, in, in the prison. And he thinks he's seeing a vision, right? So he's just following along, doing, following this angel. When they were past the first and the second ward, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of his own accord. So this is like a miracle jailbreak, right? Where he wakes Peter up, walks him out. He's between two soldiers, right? So they're staying asleep. He's going out. He's thinking it's a vision. They get to the gate. Right, that just opens of its own, that was locked, right? And they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. So now Peter, the angel's gone now. When Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel, and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod, and from all the expectation of the people and of the Jews. Because remember, up until this point, he just thought it was a vision. He's just following this angel, and then he comes, the angel leaves, and he realizes, hey, I'm actually out of prison. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. So this is the church getting together, praying for Peter. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, 
a damsel came to hearken named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. So Peter's knocking on the door, right? She says, oh, that's Peter's voice. She goes in and tells everyone who's praying for Peter. And they said unto her, thou art mad. You're crazy. But she constantly affirmed. Right? She's like saying, no, 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 that it was even so. Then said they, no, nah, it is his angel, right? But Peter continued knocking, and when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished, right? Now, I just find this story really funny because I think it shows the humanity, right, of, of the disciples. And we can really relate to this. That's often we pray as a church, but we don't always believe what we're praying for. And God is answering the prayer. Peter is at the door knocking. The Rhoda says, hey, the prayer is answered. And they're like, nah, it's his angels. And even when they see him, they're surprised. But then yet they're praying with such fervency, right? That Peter would get out of jail and yet they're still astonished. So I think it's funny that, you know, this is just how we are, right? We, we struggle to pray. We struggle to believe. And, you know, uh, Jesus says that we have faith. If we have faith just as a grain of mustard seed, we could move mountains. So it's something that every believer struggles with, to believe what they are praying. That's why sometimes we need to hear sermons like this, right? To remind us <coughs> that prayer does make a difference. Because often you pray and you pray and you pray and you think, you know, you're not really seeing a difference. You know, maybe you're not, maybe, maybe it's something that, you know, you're asking for that you shouldn't ask for. You know, maybe you're asking for something that, you know, we don't know. That's why we pray for everything because we don't know what God will give us and what he will. Because sometimes it's better that we don't get what we ask for. You know, I always remember the example in Genesis and I learned this from a preacher in Perth where if you remember the exchange between Abraham and, uh, and, and the Lord, where the Lord went in to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Because of all the homosexuality that was going on there, all the fornication and all that wickedness. And he was going to just destroy the whole city. And remember Abraham, he asked, he prays to God. You know, hey, there's just 50 righteous. There's just 40 righteous. And we see here that prayer actually makes a difference, right? Prayer actually makes, because it actually changed, because God was going to go down there and just destroy the whole city. But because Abraham prayed to God and asked, Lot was actually spared. But the interesting thing that this preacher in Perth sort of mentioned is that when Lot came out, remember he got drunk and he slept with his daughters, and then what was born from his daughters from that incestuous relationship was Moab and Ammon, which was the Moabites and the Ammonites, right? And they were enemies of the nation of Israel. So what's interesting is that sometimes God gives us what we want, but it's not always the best. Right? Because God gave Abraham what he wanted, but it actually caused a lot of problems. It might actually have been better if Lot was taken down with that city. We don't know, right? But that's just how things worked out. But my point is that we don't always know. That's why we don't... Sometimes, you know, we, we pray for things. Thank God we have the Holy Spirit sometimes to, to interpret because sometimes we will pray for things that we shouldn't and the Holy Spirit will make sure that our prayers go up as something that is pleasing to God. But sometimes we need to hear sermons like this because we need to be reminded that prayer does make a difference <coughs> because like i said it's something that we all struggle with but here we see paul i like always preaching on this passage when we talk about prayer because we see here the confidence that paul has because he prays to god right he says i thank my god upon every remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine for you all making request with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now being confident of this very thing. So he's praying for the Philippians. He says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So we see this pattern, right? That Paul is praying for these churches, praying that they would, that they would catch a glimpse, right? That their eyes would be opened, and that they would live for God. But look, he says here, even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, and as much as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye, are, ye all are partakers of my grace. So I think it's interesting here that Paul says, he, see, I'm confident that Jesus is going to work in your life. He's going to open your eyes. He's going to change you. Why? Because I have you in my heart. See, he says, it's meet for me to think this of you all. See, he's confident and it's meet for him to think that God's going to work in the life of the believers that he knows. Why? Because he's praying for them. So, I hope, you know, you pray for your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, start taking the prayer list a little bit more seriously. You know, put your prayer requests on there. 
update your prayer request, use it, you know, make sure you save the link. And remember, we got the prayer, prayer and fasting, 7 o'clock on Fridays. So this, this was all just a promo sermon, right? Because it's just all to get you guys. Come on Friday <laughs> to, to the prayer and fasting. All right, I hope you learned something. Let's pray. <clears throat> thank you, Lord. Um, thank you for everything you do for us. Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes and help us to see you in all your glory and, and see you for what you do for us. See you for what you've done for us, Lord, that you've died for us on the cross and rose again, given us a place in heaven, given us so many things we don't deserve, Lord, even just physically and spiritually. So we pray, Lord, that we would see you as your word reveals you, and Lord, that, it would, um, that the love of Christ would constrain us and it would push us on to, to do great things, that we would stand perfect and, and, and be complete in all the will of God. So thank you, Lord. Um, I pray that you would uh, use this sermon to, to light a fire in the believers here. Lord, that we would take prayer uh, more seriously, that when we pray, that we know we have a God that is listening, and that, Lord, you answer prayers in your time. But uh, I pray, Lord, that we would uh, harness this privilege that you've given us. Because, Lord, we will only be, I guess, praying when we're on earth, where we can't see you. But in heaven, you know, we'll be able to see you face to face. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for everything, um, and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.